I start this session. And uh, the first speaker is Gerda Nains from CERN. Uh, she speaks about nuclear physics at this older CERN. Gerda, the floor is yours. Thanks for the introduction, Bjorn. So it's a real pleasure that I can give this talk at uh, your 10th Tastes of Nuclear Physics in South Africa. It's of course a pity we can't be there in person, but on the other hand, it guarantees that you have a very wide audience and a broad attendance, as you just said. So I will present nuclear physics uh, at Isolde, and then uh, later on today, Carl will present the solid state physics, and there will also be a few more other contributions. Also, Krish will say something. Uh, so well, everybody knows it, but just let me remind you that CERN is, uh, is all the CERN's radioactive beam facility. So we are using about 50% of all the protons that are being produced um, at CERN in the PS booster, where the protons are accelerated to 1.4 GeV, uh, and the isotopes are selected uh, after they are diffusing out of tick targets using the isotope separation online method. So we can access radioactive isotopes, which have typical half-lives of more than a few tens of milliseconds. So the radioisotopes at Isolde are produced using uh, different reactions, and that's why it, what it makes uh, unique worldwide, uh, because we can make use of the very high energy of the protons to induce uh, spallation, fragmentation, and fission reactions of, for example, a heavy target like uranium-238, thus producing all radioisotopes over the nuclear chart. This has resulted in, by now, more than 1,300 different exotic isotopes or isomeric beams of more than 74 chemical elements. In order to select one isotope out of the hundreds that are produced in the target, uh, we need very selective uh, procedures. And one of them has been applied now since many years. It's based on the resonance ionization laser uh, ion source, which allows us to resonantly excite and ionize uh, all the isotopes of one particular element. So, if you then look at the chart of the nuclei here at the bottom, where you have on the x-axis the number of neutrons in the nucleus and on the y-axis the number of protons, it means that an element selection is selecting all isotopes along this uh, horizontal line. Then to make a further selection of an isotope with one particular mass, you send the uh, isotope or the, 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 the beam you accelerated and it's sent through a mass separator and then you make a selection into the mass of the isotopes, which is equal to the sum of the number of protons and neutrons in the isotope, which makes a second selection. And so in the end, you get a pure isotopic beam. So CERN uh, and Isolde in particular has more than 50 years of experience in producing radioactive isotopes. And here you see, again, a summary of all the different isotopes that have been already produced at Isolde with yields going from, let's say, one per sec or one microcoulomb up to 10 to the 12 per microcoulomb. The facility today exists of uh, two target stations where the protons can hit the target and uh, where the ions are then diffusing out of the target and being sent through uh, a mass separator, a high resolution mass separator or a general purpose mass separator. They can also be cooled and bunched in a, an ion cooler buncher. And then from there, they are distributed in the different low energy beam lines of the Isolde facility where more than 10 different permanent experimental setups are located. They can also be sent into a charge breeder to be uh, highly uh, charged. And from there, they are sent into our post accelerator, which allows to accelerate the beams up to about 10 MeV per nucleon. This accelerator has been built in stages. So uh, for, since 2001, we are running the REX uh, normal conductor linear accelerator, which was able to produce beams initially to 2.8 and later up to 3.1 MeV per nucleon. And this uh, accelerator has been running till 2012. In the long shutdown, the first long shutdown of CERN uh, in 2013, 
uh, and then beyond 2014, preparations were made to build uh, a, a further extension of the accelerator. And this was done in the next year. So gradually every year, one superconducting uh, module was uh, added, including each five uh, superconducting RF cavities to boost the energy up to almost 10 MeV per nucleon. Additionally, three new beam lines were added with, for three per permanent experimental stations. So the research program at Isolde is very diverse, as you can see here, uh, from the last year of running before the long shutdown at CERN. Um, so 35% of the beam is used for nuclear structure low energy experiments, so beta decay and ground state properties. And the other 35% is used to re-accelerate the beams to higher energies to induce nuclear reactions with radioisotopes using the different experimental stations there. So this is Coulomb excitation transfer uh, and scattering chamber experiments. And another 20% of the remaining beam time is used uh, for applications or, well, it's also fundamental physics, but uh, the isotopes then are used as probes to study the properties of solid materials or of biochemical materials. Let me start with accelerated radioactive ion beams. As I said, this has started already 20, almost 20 years ago now at Isolde. And because the energy was quite low in the beginning, most of the experiments were, that were performed were Coulomb excitation experiments. And you've heard already very nice talks about those experiments uh, from Peter Butler and from Liam Gaffney yesterday. And you will hear more about that from recent measurements from Nigel Ward and Kenzo Abrahams. Uh, Liam also uh, introduced briefly not only the miniball detector and the Coulomb excitation studies that have been done, but also uh, gave us an outlook to uh, a new experimental device that was used for the first time just before the long shutdown at the end of 2018, uh, based on the Isolde solenoid spectrometer. So in this talk, I'll not say too much about Coulomb excitation because there are plenty of talks about that. Let me just highlight one uh, experiment that was done uh, with Rex Isolde and which also illustrates the capabilities of uh, Isolde to produce pure isomeric beams and to use those for uh, nuclear reaction studies. And this uh, here is shown in this graph. So it is possible uh, with the resonance ionization laser ion source to tune the laser frequency in such a way that, for example, only the uh, copper 68 is produced in its isomeric state. And then you can look, uh, accelerate that beam and look at the gamma decay from the excited states above the six minus isomer. So feeding into the four minus, which then decays back with three, three gammas to the ground state. So you get here this in a very nice clean spectrum. Or you can set the laser frequency to produce the one plus ground state and not the isomeric state. And then you get this spectrum here where you see that only this level here is excited in the reaction. And so this allows to, to study the properties of uh, long-lived uh, states in uh, an isotope independently. So as I said, since 2015, the high Isolde uh, superconducting linnet has been constructed, opening a new window for experiments uh, up to about 10 MeV per nucleon. This means mostly more efficient Coulomb excitation and uh, also extending transfer reaction studies from the light nuclei up to the very heavy beams, uh, like to, uh, uh, into the radium region. The gain for Coulomb excitation is really significant, and that was proven at, uh, with the very first experiment that was done already in 2015, right after the first cryo module had been installed. Uh, and that is shown here in this graph. So you see nicely, here you have the gamma counts as a function of the gamma ray energy, which is detected from a, a zinc beam that has been accelerated to two different energies. So in the beginning, we had a, an energy of 2.8 MeV, and that's the red spectrum. And you have to look here at this peak, which is the two to zero transition in uh, 74 zinc. And you see that with a beam energy of 4 MeV per nucleon, the blue spectrum, in just four, five hours, you get the same statistics as with a beam energy of 2.8 MeV, but taken for 16 hours. 
But more importantly, you don't only gain a lot in statistics for the same time, but also you have access to new excited states. So with the higher energy, you can also look at excitations of to the four plus state and get access to the transition probability of the four to two. So the first physics campaign started then in 2016 after the second cryo module had been entered uh, in the spring of that same year. And uh, experiments were done with radioactive beams uh, all over the nuclear chart. Four of them were Coulomb excitation experiments using the mini ball detector. And one of them was uh, an experiment using uh, a lithium-9 beam, which was accelerated already at that time to 6.8 MeV per nucleon, because lighter beams you can accelerate to much higher energies with the same uh, accelerator properties because uh, the, of the lower uh, mass-to-charge ratio that can be used. And that experiment was done in the scattering chamber. So then followed uh, every year, one more cryo module was added. So in the spring of 17, the third one was added. And then after that, from uh, August and, uh, or July until uh, end of November, December, several experiments were done. In 17, we already used the three beam lines. So the two uh, experiments that were used were mini ball and the scattering chamber. And this was also the first time that the a beam was sent into the uh, isoldosolonite spectrometer, which was nicely introduced yesterday by Liam, uh, to look at the transmission into this new device, which was found to be very well. The next year, the final cryo module was added in the spring of 2018. And then the operations team at Isoldo got really a handle a good hand on operating the beams because uh, in a period of just a few months, they accelerated 18 different beams and they sent them into three different experimental setups. So as we heard already a lot from Kulex excitation, I would like to show here just a result from uh, the two experiments that have been done using the Isolde solenoid spectrometer. And more in particular, I'll focus on the 28 magnesium DP reaction that was uh, performed, as we already heard the results from the mercury experiment uh, yesterday in Leon Stokes. So this experiment was performed uh, by Dave Sharp and his collaborators. And uh, the goal was to look into excited states of 29 magnesium by accelerating the 28 magnesium beam uh, up to nine and a half MeV per nucleon. So uh, they were sent inside the Isolde solenoid spectrometer onto a target which was placed in the middle and then the protons are emitted and detected along an array of silicon detectors, so possession sensitive detectors. Uh, this experiment was done with a beam of about 10 to the 6 particles per second. Note that I stole this slide from a presentation that was given last week at the uh, Isolde workshop uh, by the PhD student who was analyzing this experiment and who won for his presentation the second best young speaker award. Um, so here's the result of the experiment. So they could identify very clearly 14 different excited states in 29 magnesium. Um, and also, by looking at the angular distributions for each of these transitions, they could uh, uniquely identify the uh, L value of the orbital. So assigning clearly uh, single particle properties to each of these levels. So this work is in preparation for publication and we look forward to uh, the results that will come soon. I would also like to highlight another talk that was given last week at the Azolde collaboration meeting and that is what is yet to come at ISOLD uh, at the ISS experiment. So uh, Liam showed that uh, the Liverpool team is building a, a dedicated, uh, very uh, performant uh, uh, silicon detector array to be built into the ISS. But in parallel, there's a second development ongoing at the University of Leuven, where under, in the group of Ricardo Rabe, uh, an active target is being constructed to be uh, mounted inside the ISS and to be surrounded by 45 cerium bromide detectors for gamma detection. So this detector will allow to perform at the same time particle tracking. And here you see the first measurement based on an alpha source in the, into the gas chamber and make correlations with the gamma decay coming 
from these uh, excited levels. So this will make the uh, experiment extremely sensitive for high resolution studies uh, at the same time. Also, this uh, talk was given uh, a Best uh, Young Speaker Award. In fact, this was given to Lexi for, uh, and he got the, the first prize. So now let me move to low energy physics. Um, so at Isolde, low energy physics is existing since uh, the very first uh, years and it has been growing ever since and more and more experimental setups have been added. Uh, and today I would like to show the results from a few of those uh, experiments. So we have mass measurements using uh, the panning trap initially, but the recently also uh, an MR of mass spectrometer. We have a dedicated uh, Isolde decay station, which is uh, maintained and operated by a collaboration since, about, uh, since 2015. It's a very versatile setup with specific detectors for gamma, beta, alpha, and neutron detection. We have several experiments uh, using uh, lasers for laser spectroscopy, uh, both collinear and in the ion source. And if you want to read more about all these uh, experiments and about the evolution of how they, the, these experiments are resolved and how they are going to move forward also in the future playing leading roles uh, in this kind of uh, physics. Let's have a look at the CERN Courier of September of, of October. It's online available and there's a nice paper describing uh, the history of these masses and radii measurements. We also have fundamental interaction studies uh, these are performed now in the WIZARD experiment, which stands for Weak Interaction Studies using the argon decay. Uh, so this is looking at the proton decay, beta-delayed proton decay of 32 argon to look for uh, new physics beyond the standard model in the uh, in beta decay of uh, 32 argon. And finally, there are a series of material research experiments using a variety of experimental techniques, hyperfine techniques mostly, uh, where radioactive probes are used to study the electrical and magnetic properties and the local positioning of uh, uh, impurities into different materials. Look, using, for example, emission channeling, and here you see a nice picture, but also perturbed angular correlations, beta nuclear magnetic resonance and Mills Bohr experiments, uh, and several other, and you will hear a lot about that, uh, in particular on Mersbauer in the talk by Krisch and in the talk by Karl on the other experiments. So here, oops, I think I'm doing something wrong. So uh, on the low energy, uh, energy side, there's also several talks at this meeting uh, um, of recent results by, presented by Maria, for example, on the uh, electron capture and beta decay of boron-8, uh, but these two I already mentioned. And there's also a talk tomorrow uh, by Ronald Garcia Ruiz, speaking about the first studies we did on uh, the spectroscopy of radioactive molecules and how these molecules in the future will help us to review, uh, to look for uh, new fundamental science questions, both in nuclear and in uh, fundamental uh, symmetry research. So let me now come to a few recent measurements and results, and let me start with mass measurements. So masses uh, are a, a basic property of isotopes and reveal a lot of information about the interactions of protons and neutrons uh, in the atomic nucleus. Uh, as you know, the sum of the mass of the protons and the neutrons inside the nucleus is somewhat heavier than uh, when those protons and neutrons are bound together in a nucleus. And that the difference in that energy is called the binding energy. So by measuring masses, we can look how strongly the nucleons are bound into a nucleus. And that information can then be used to learn something about the nuclear structure. This is here shown with the example of the calcium isotopes, which have been studied at Isolde and also more recently at uh, Riken, uh, and where you can plot this binding energy that is measured, extracted from the measured masses, as a function of the neutron number in the calcium isotopes. And then you see that as you add more and more neutrons, the neutrons get less and less bound uh, when you go to the more neutron-rich regions. 
Now in this graph, this looks like a very smooth trend and nothing particular seems to be happening. However, if you plot this now as the two neutron separation energy, where you would take the difference in the binding energy between a nucleus with n and n minus two nucleons, then you see that some kinks appear. And these kinks appear at what we are called magic numbers in uh, the nuclear shell model. So as you add more neutrons between, beyond n equal 20, the, last, the next neutron gets suddenly a lot less bound. And that is because this here is a shell gap. So uh, there's a gap in energy between uh, nucleons occupying less than 20 neutrons and more than 20 neutrons. And then the same is seen at neutron number 28. And these are the well-known magic, magic numbers of the shell model. Then if you go to the more exotic isotopes, you see that a similar kink seems to appear at n equals 32, suggesting that also 32 has some kind of a shell uh, structure effect, and maybe even at n equals 34. And then by measuring other properties like radii, excitation energies, and so on, you can study further this uh, changing uh, in, in the cell shell structure. And then by comparing to nuclear models, you can try to understand what's happening with the structure in these neutron-rich nuclei. A recent result from Isolde in mass measurements uh, was published this year by uh, Vladimir Mania and Jonas Kartain in Fisgraph Letters. They have been able to measure uh, for the first time uh, how the shell gap n equals 82 is changing as you remove uh, protons from uh, these nuclei going down below TIN-132, which is a well-known doubly magic isotope. So here you see the neutron binding energy as the proton number. So if you remove protons and you go to the cadmium, you see here that the n equals 82 gap shifts to decrease a little bit as you go below uh, n equals, uh, z equals 50. This measurement was done not using the penning trap, but by using two new techniques that have uh, been uh, developed in the last years. Uh, one is based on the multi-reflection type of light mass spectrometry technique, which is an extremely sensitive technique because it allows to perform measurements on beams that are uh, very weakly produced and which are, are coming with a very large amount of contamination, such as the cadmium-132 beam, which was produced in a large background of barium-132 and cesium-132. Uh, and another technique that was used to uh, resolve very uh, close lying levels in one nucleus, so two long lived isomeric states in 129 cadmium were seen with a difference in energy of just a few hundred keV. And in this experiment, it could be shown that the 11 minus state, which is a hole in the H11 half uh, orbital, becomes the ground state in 129 cadmium, whereas in all the other cadmium isotopes, it's a uh, uh, Sorry, uh, it, yeah, it is an isomeric state. So here in cadmium, it's the three half that it's an isomeric state and it's the 11 halves that it's the ground state. And in this experiment, the uh, excitation energy of this isomer could be measured for the first time using the phase imaging ion cyclotron resonance method. So let me now move to another type of experiments and that's uh, um, laser spectroscopy experiments. So, Laser spectroscopy experiments are very pro powerful because they allow to measure three ground state or long lived isomeric state properties at the same time. Uh, with laser spectroscopy, we have a direct, uh, the possibility to have a direct measurement of the nuclear spin, not always, but in many cases it's possible. We can measure the magnetic dipole moment, which gives, which gives us information uh, for the, uh, in the case that the isotopes are in the region of uh, closed shells, about uh, which orbital is occupied by the unpaired uh, valence nucleon, proton and neutron. And we have access to the electric quadrupole moment and the mean square charge radius, which give us information about the shape and the size of nuclei. So by performing such experiments, we have really a lot of information to test modern nuclear theories and to get information on the nuclear structure, both the single particle and the collective properties. Laser spectroscopy is based on studying the hyperfine structure in atomic nuclei. 
So it means we look not at the nuclear structure directly, but we measure uh, the structure of the atom or the ion by probing the uh, fine structure transitions uh, with a very narrow band laser. For example, here we have a fine structure transition in copper, which is uh, about 325 nanometers or in electron volts, about four electron volts. So by using a narrow band laser, we can probe now the hyperfine splitting, which is uh, of the order of a few micro electron volts, which is very tiny compared to the laser energy. But however, due to the narrow bandwidth of the laser, we can probe each of these excitations independently. And then by measuring the uh, photons that are emitted when these excited levels decay back to the ground state, we can uh, identify each of these transitions. And by fitting these spectra, we are sensitive to the magnetic hyperfine parameter, which depends on the nuclear magnetic moment and the nuclear G factor directly, uh, as well, of course, on the atomic hyperfine field, which we have to know, for example, from uh, our initial type of uh, atomic calculations. We can also extract the nuclear quadrupole moment from the B parameter. And we also have access to the nuclear spin because both the spin uh, the, the peak intensities and the peak positions are correlated and depending on this uh, nuclear spin. Of course, uh, to allow a spin dependent, it's clear that we need to resolve each of these peaks clearly. And so that is, means that we need very high uh, resolution techniques for that. Now, uh, the fourth observable that can be measured is the isotope shift which is a change in the position of the center of this hyperfine spectrum for each consecutive isotope. And that gives us information on the mean square charge radius. So the techniques that are used at ISOLDE are uh, using different experimental setups uh, to do laser spectroscopy. And the first one I would like to show is the resonant ionization laser ion source. So this is the ion source that we use to resonantly excite uh, and then ionize the atoms in the ion source. Now, if in that, in that process, you tune your laser in such a way to uh, operate it in a narrow band mode, you can uh, scan or resonantly excite each of the hyperfine levels one by one, rather than all of them at the same time, which is what you would like to do if you want to do produce uh, all the, uh, ions, uh, all the uh, ions at the same time. So then if you detect the resonantly ex uh, excited ions, uh, after you have been uh, exciting them, you can scan each of these hyperfine transitions. This is a very highly sensitive experimental technique, uh, which can be performed on beams of less than one atoms per second. But the resolution is not very high because you have to do this uh, in a hot cavity ion source, which has of the order of uh, several thousands of Kelvin. So the typical resolution is two to four gigahertz, which means that you can apply this technique mostly to uh, um, elements that have a very large hyperfine structure like heavy elements. And in many cases, the resolution is not enough to resolve, for example, the hyperfine B parameter, which is a smaller interaction than the magnetic interaction. So quadrupole moments and spins are not so easily de determined with the in-source technique. But you have access to extremely exotic isotopes. The collinear laser spectroscopy technique, which is nowadays applied in two experimental uh, setups uh, at Isolde, is uh, based on the fact that when you accelerate the ions from uh, zero electron volt in the ion source, say up to 40 to 50 kilo electron volts, the energy uncertainty, which uh, gives rise to this big Doppler groaning, so big velocity spread in the ion source, uh, remains the same on, on acceleration. So then if you look to the velocity spread after acceleration, you see that it's very much narrower. And so that's why with an accelerated beam, and collinear overlapping a laser beam with the ion beam, you can get a very high resolution to resolve all the hyperfine peaks of the order of 2200 megahertz, which is about 50 times uh, better than uh, in the laser ion source. 
As I said, there's two experiments that are used at Isolde, and they are based on the different te the detection techniques. The first one is more than 40 years old, and it's looking at the fluorescence decay after resonant excitation by one laser uh, beam, which is being uh, probed. This experiment uh, can nowadays be performed on beams of a few thousand of ions per second, thanks to the fact that we have now a cooler buncher to bunch the ion beam and measure photons only when the ion bunch comes in from front of the photodetectors, thus reducing the photon background by a factor of 10 to the 4. Since 2012, we also have uh, installed a new experimental uh, collinear beamline, which is based on the highly sensitive resonance ionization deck technique that is also used in the ion source. So here we scan the first laser and then we resonantly ionize and we detect the ions. And because ions can be deflected out of the beamline, uh, this experiment can be done in ultra low background conditions. So typically one event per 10 minutes, which means it's highly sensitive and it can be performed of beams of just 10, uh, tens of ions per second. Uh, so this has been developed over the last uh, 10 years at Isolde, and uh, we have by now reached the same resolution as can be achieved with the optical detection. And we have shown that we can do indeed the experiment on beams of just 20 ions per second. So here in this graph, we show, we show the spectrum that was obtained with a pulsed broadband laser, uh, which is narrow band in RILAS. Uh, with a beam uh, um, with a line width of the order of almost two mega two gigahertz, compared to twenty megahertz for the same experiment in the collinear geometry and with narrow band pulsed lasers. So let me come to some results from laser experiments. And the first uh, experiment I would like to show uh, is the shape staggering in the mercury isotopes. This experiment was possible. Uh, thanks to the combination of uh, three different experimental stations. First of all, the ions are produced uh, in, the, in a plasma ion source by shooting the protons on a molten lead target, and the mercury ions are resonantly uh, produced using the release ion source. And the first step of the uh, ion source uh, lasers is operated in a narrow band mode to scan the hyperfine structure of the mercury in the first excited uh, hyperfine level. And this is what allows to perform the laser spectroscopy. Uh, now to detect this signal, three different stations were used uh, for these isotopes. For the very intense beams, a Faraday cup was used. For beams that were heavily contaminated with isobars, the MRTOV mass spectrometer was used. And for uh, beams which were decaying by alpha decay, the windmill uh, detection system with uh, the alpha decay setup was being used. And that allowed the collaboration to perform experiments over a very wide range of mercury isotopes, going from 177 mercury on the very neutron deficient side, produced at less than one ion per second, up to the uh, line of stability towards N equals one. Uh, 126, the closed neutron shell gap, where the beams are produced in the order of several picograms of intensity. So here you see, uh, see a few typical spectra. And as you can see, the most exotic mercury egg isotope was studied with a rate on resonance of just 0 0.3, 0 0.03 ions per second. But as I said, the resolution is quite low, so 4.5 gigahertz. However, for this experiment, this was not a problem because the hyperfine splitting uh, in mercury is very large and still with this uh, low resolution, you can still nicely resolve all the hyperfine peaks. The results from this experiment is shown in these two graphs here. So here you see the change in the mean square charge radius as a function of the neutron number in black for the lead isotopes and in red uh, and black as well for the mercury isotopes compared to one another and normalized to the isotope at one neutron number 126. And you see that the two show a steady decrease when you remove neutrons is what we would expect. 
But at uh, neutron midshell here, you see a sudden staggering appearing in the mercury isotopes. That was known already for many years because this experiment was already done in the 70s at Eisholder. However, now by combining these uh, three techniques, it was possible to confirm the earlier studies and to extend this further down to the very neutron deficient side to show that the staggering suddenly disappears again and goes back to a normal steady decrease. Here you see the change in the size of the mercury and the lead isotopes, uh, again, nicely showing the staggering. This was explained uh, for the first time now with large scale uh, shell model calculations by using the Monte Carlo shell model, which is the first time that this model could be used in such a heavy mass region. And it allowed to understand the microscopic origin of this shaped staggering uh, this was known already that it was related to particle hole excitations of protons across the Z equals 82 shell gap. But now it was shown through the calculations, which nicely reproduce the observed trend in the charge radii. That's the blue, the calculations with their arrow bars, and the red are the data points. And you see there's an excellent agreement. And it shows that not only protons are excited across the Z equals 82 shell gap in these isotopes, which have a strong deformation, but also there is a higher population of neutrons in the I-13 house orbital. And so it's due to the strong proton-neutron tensor interaction between these protons and neutrons in these particular orbits that the shape staggering is appearing. Okay, I have to come to the end. So I'd let me show one final Chris result. So the collinear resonance ionization spectroscopy experiment uh, was built, as I said, uh, a few years ago, uh, and it overlaps a laser beam with a um, um, with a the bunched ion beam from the Isol de Cooler and Buncher. Uh, and first, it goes through a charge exchange cell where the ions are neutralized because the laser spectroscopy in copper is better done on the atom. So uh, by using these two transitions to first probe the hyperfine structure and then put a broadband laser to ionize these ions here in this interaction region. Now, because of the ultra high vacuum in this region, there are, are hardly any uh, collisional uh, excitations. So all the ions that are produced are coming through this resonance laser ionization process. So it means if we now deflect these ions on a particle detector, we get uh, ultra low background conditions. In the best cases, we've achieved one count per uh, hour background rate. Uh, the efficiency of the uh, experiment is also very high from the, uh, just before the cooler buncher up to the ion detection, we get an efficiency of the order of 1%. And that has allowed us to study the charge radii of the copper isotopes up to 78 copper. And now I see I have highlighted the wrong elements here. It should have been 76 copper and 78 copper. I'm sorry. So we have studied uh, the copper isotopes all the way up to here. So these uh, were already studied before using the fluorescence detection in the collapse experiment. And with Chris, we could extend the three isotopes more exotic. Uh, and here you see a spectrum that was taken in just 10 minutes for 76 copper which is produced at the rate of a few thousand per second. And this here is the spectrum for 78 copper, which is produced at an intensity of just 20 ions per second, and for which it took us eight hours. Here you see also why we need the high resolution, because in 78 copper, which is very close to the doubly magic nickel, the magnetic and the quadrupole moment are extremely small, which means that the hyperfine structure is very collapsed. Here you see it's all within uh, a few, uh, almost, I would say, one gigahertz, whereas here it's spanning seven uh, gigahertz. This experiment was uh, done with a count rate of 0.06 ions per second on resonance, which is, by the way, quite similar to the in-source experiment, but with a 50 times better resolution than in-source. And because of this high precision that we could achieve on the charged radii, you see here the change in the mean squared charge radii for the whole change of isotopes up to n equals 50 almost. And we could also look uh, at the three point uh, staggering parameter, which shows us 
the, uh, very nicely the odd even staggering in the charge radii, which is a well-known phenomenon relating to the pairing. And then you see that towards 78 nickel uh, or 78 copper, this staggering seems to disappear. And this has been understood as related to the fact that there's a spin inversion at n equals 46 between the protons and the neutron orbitals. And it's a specific proton neutron correlations will lead to this disappearing or even staggering. And that was very nicely reproduced by modern uh, Cal uh, by modern calculations, sorry, uh, using the in medium SRG uh, technique uh, and using interactions derived from QCD through chiral effective theory. And these uh, interactions were fitted to properties of mass uh, of nuclei with just up to mass four and could very nicely reproduce this even staggering. So before ending, one more different experiment, which I would like to, to show as well. And here, uh, that's showing also the strength again of Isolde. We combine our expertise in different collaborations. So here, for example, we combine solid state physics with nuclear structure to look for a new way to identify for the first time very precisely the excitation energy of the 229 isomer in thorium. This isomer has been studied in the last years very intensely by many uh, groups around the world. But until now, the excitation energy of this isomeric state, which is at the moment known uh, to be 8.3 with an electro and with an energy of 0.1 EV, uh, is uh, very, is, well, is well known, is only known indirectly. So all the measurements that have been performed were done indirectly. And uh, the goal would be to measure for the first time directly the radioactive, uh, the radiative decay of this uh, uh, excited state. Now, this energy, why is this isomer so interesting? It's because it is coming in the range of lasers because eight electron volt is about 150 nanometers. So it's accessible in the very uh, ultraviolet laser range by dedicated lasers. We could think of exciting this isomer, nuclear isomer with lasers. And that would be a unique thing and opening the possibility to build, for example, a nuclear clock. Now to see this radioactive decay, which is overwhelmed by the internal conversion that dominates this decay branch, you can uh, do a trick. And uh, the idea is to do two new things here. First of all, the idea is to produce the isomeric state, not in the decay uh, of uranium, as it's done uh, nowadays in most of the experiments, but to produce it through the beta decay of 229 actinium. So an act uh, 229 actinium was produced at Isolde and implanted in a um, crystal calcium fluoride, which has a very wide band gap. Now, due to this wide band gap, the internal conversion is blocked and so it should be possible to see indeed the radioactive decay, the radiative decay using a dedicated VUV spectrometer. Of course, the crystal has to be transparent as well, and that's why calcium fluoride is so interesting. However, to fill that band gap, the actinium has to take a substitutional site, and that's where the colleagues of solid state physics, physics helped us to measure that. So through emission channeling, it could be proven that indeed the actinium and so also then the decaying uh, thorium are sitting on substitutional site filling this uh, uh, band gap. So this will be continued after the shutdown and that experiment is now in full preparation. So I would like to conclude. Isolde is now producing slow and accelerated radioactive beams up to about 10 MeV per nucleon for a dozen of permanent experimental stations and a few spaces for traveling setups for a wide variety of physics. And in the future, we also hope to expand CERN for uh, Isolde further and to fully exploit its capabilities at CERN uh, through the project we called EPIC, exploiting the potential of Isolde at CERN. And I would like to thank all my collaborators uh, in the Isolde as well as in the Collapse and the CRIS collaborations. Thank you. Thank you, Gerda, for a beautiful talk. I think we give her an applause. So we have two, two three questions. 
uh, the first one is how many experiments can one do simultaneously at this order? At the moment, uh, one can uh, do uh, two experiments at the same time, uh, although this is not done routinely. But what we do, uh, what uh, Carl has been able to schedule because uh, it's a quite complicated beam schedule and Carl, uh, one of the next speakers is our uh, coordinator for beam scheduling. And he has been able to schedule uh, experiments for solid state physics, which are done uh, in one part of the Isolde hall. And I can show maybe the slides to illustrate it um, in parallel uh, to experiments uh, that are done here. So you see, we have two target stations and target, uh, ions from this target station can feed into these experimental stations here, independent from uh, ions that are produced in this target station and that can be sent in the rest of the hall. So these experiments can be run in parallel and have been running in parallel from time to time. Okay, and another question was <clears throat> the purity of the radioactive beams with laser. Ion source. How pure um, the purity uh, depends very much from uh, isotope to isotope, not even from element to element. It really depends on which isobar is in the beam. Uh, even if you use the laser ion source, you still can have from time to time uh, very high uh, isobaric contamination. And so apart from using the laser ion source, in some cases, uh, we are also using specific uh, ion sources, for example, in the neutron rich fission region around TIN 132, uh, in some, uh, um, some uh, isobars, some, some masses of uh, neutron rich uh, tin or cadmium or uh, antimony, there's an overwhelming amount of uh, cesium uh, and uh, rubidium or other isotopes, and those can be reduced by using uh, not a fission reaction, but uh, induced by protons, but by neutrons. And that reduces a lot the production of the isobar. So in that case, a neutron converter target is used. So we have different ways to clean the beam and it's very hard. Uh, I mean, it's isotope dependent, element and isotope dependent. In some cases it's pure. In some cases you can have a million more isobars than isotopes of interest. Okay. Um, well, there is one more question, maybe. Uh, well, at which uh, elements have you reached the drip line? So, and I'm not sure uh, that you've been at it all or worldwide. But. Okay, so I have a slide on that as well. Okay, so here you see um, the blue are the most exotic cases that have been produced and studied. So you see in the tin region, for example, we are going quite well beyond TIN-132 on the neutron uh, deficient side. And uh, we are here, there's something I don't understand. I think they, they did also that. going quite <clears throat> well below N equals 50 on this side. I think there's something wrong here. Uh, that's impossible. I have to verify this. Yeah, I think it's for it's, example in the neutron rich side here, yeah. we are going beyond n equals 20. So yeah, mm. we reach the drip lines like at Riken. I would say Isolde is nowadays not anymore a discovery facility. Something like so the facility for precision studies. Okay, Gerda, thank you again. And I think we should continue now with Chris Barut Ram that will speak about most part per construct. Copy at the solder. Thank you, Gerda. Can we share screen with Chris? Uh, let me get to. Okay. <clears throat> 